Hello and welcome to another edition of the C Squared Podcast. This is your host, Aaliyah, and I'm here with my co-host, Curtis. And today we have on the talented Natasha Gorey of Looters PR to talk to us about PR. Um, So first and foremost, thank you, Natasha, for joining us on our podcast today. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So as a general rule, what we usually start off with, Natasha, is uh, mm-hmm. kind of like get the background of the person involved. So if you could tell us a little short, brief summary of who you are and what you do for the listeners, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Um, so my name is Natasha Gray, as they mentioned in the intro. Um, I am a publicist at Looters, which is a really awesome PR marketing firm. Uh, mainly we deal with a lot of rock and punk and metal. Um, which is a lot of fun, all kinds of genres though mixed in there as well. Um, and yeah, I grew up in New Brunswick and made my way into Toronto, which has been amazing. Um, and yeah, so I've been working in the music industry for about uh, four years now, five years now, which is kind of a bit crazy. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Uh, so just as a quick follow up to that, can you kind of go over your background a little bit in PR or how you kind of got started in it? Absolutely. Um, so I took music business at Humber when I moved to Toronto, actually. Um, I was trying to find my way in the music industry, not really sure exactly what, uh, what area I wanted to go in. Um, but I ended up interning actually for a radio tracking company. And one of the girls I was working for at that company, um, RPM promotion, um, had actually been talking to Sarah a little bit about Hopeless and, you know, we were, the radio company was working on a campaign with Sum 41 at the time, um, who were on Hopeless Records. Um, And it just kind of came through the grapevine that Looters was hiring. And of course, being growing up, um, I was a huge fan of, you know, record labels like Hopeless Records and Fearless Records as an emo kid, Um, forever an emo kid. uh, I've never grown out of that phase. Um, so naturally I was very excited about it, uh, having, you know, hopeless and fearless being two labels that I followed growing up. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got involved at, uh, at Luders. I ended up getting hired, which was incredible. Um, and so I've been doing PR ever since. Um, I do have a background in social media, um, and marketing as I kind of, when I was in university, I went to university at Carleton in Ottawa. Um, I was involved with the marketing uh, team for the sports varsity teams. So um, that's kind of how I got started in sort of digital marketing and that kind of stuff. And then sort of gradually over time, I realized why am I working in sports? I don't care about sports Mm -hmm. (laughs) that much. Um, I'm definitely more of a music person. And that's kind of when I got the idea, like, hold on, there's got to be a music program to get into the industry somehow. Um, And so that's kind of how I got involved. I went to Humber, as I mentioned, and yeah, Mm -hmm. ended up kind of moving into Looters, which has been fantastic. So uh, I told Aaliyah she could have the next question, but I, I got to ask, does that mean that you started in Looters it's on socials? Um, so basically with Looters, actually, because Looters does a little bit more uh, than just PR. Mainly, yeah. uh, a lot of the artists kind of come to us for PR, but mm-hmm. we are also a full marketing agency. So Looters does, you know, anywhere from streaming to social media campaigns to, uh, yeah, your publicity, your, you know, uh, ad booking you're all kinds of different things uh streaming as well okay. i don't know if i mentioned that yeah mm-hmm. um so that's kind of i i manage all the social media campaigns for looters as well for artists uh specifically so i did not realize you guys were quite that extensive on the, on that mm-hmm. end of things cool 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 okay <laughs> be sure to ask some questions about that too <laughs> of course so ali i'll let you go next since uh, i've been hogging it sure so Natasha, um, with your experience um, sort of working in the PR side of things, we'll start there. Um, What do you think are some reasons why bands should seek out professional PR instead of just taking a DIY approach? Absolutely. So I think the key thing, and especially when bands are starting out, that a lot of bands don't realize or artists in general um is that it takes a while to really build your relationship with the press right it's like you don't just start out getting you know just as an example like a you know a giant print publication um it takes a lot of time and a lot of planning and a lot of strategy to really build that relationship and ultimately it happens over you know a couple releases right it doesn't happen with the first release you put out usually I mean unless you kind of get really lucky and and somehow it goes viral um that having a PR professional there to kind of help you kind of navigate that world 
is definitely a reason I would say to hire a PR uh, professional, um, especially because there's a lot of ins and outs and, you know, relationships you have to create, which they have already built over time. And, and that takes a lot of time off your plate, because obviously, you know, a huge part of being in PR is, you know, kind of chasing people down, right? Chasing them to, you know, cover something. Big part. Big exactly. part. It's, it's the main part, I would say. Um, you know, so that's obviously a lot of time, a lot of time, especially when you're a musician who, you know, primarily you want to make music. And I think, you know, the business side is something that not all musicians a, have the time for because everybody probably has a full time job on top of that. Um, and, you know, they want to focus on the music and creating. So it's kind of where someone who already has those relationships kind of formed and to kind of help you navigate that, I think, is definitely invaluable. Um, and it takes a lot off the artist's plate because there's a lot and it's all super overwhelming um, with everything they have to do. So, yeah. So um, just to follow that up. So you guys, you guys, do you handle a lot of the more indie bands? It's mainly bigger bands you guys got because you got the labels like Century Media and stuff, right? Right. Yeah. So we um, actually have at Looters, there's uh, seven record labels that Looters is on uh, for retainer clients for uh, so. different record labels. Yeah. Um, and then we also have our independent campaigns, which means basically, um, you know, either a label or an artist or a manager has hired us on a camp, uh, project basis, yep. um, you know, an album, a tour. So we do uh, lots of those as well, um, which we do have a fair amount of up, camp, up and coming bands. Mm -hmm. um, you know, recently we just did, uh, which you guys interviewed Osiren. So that's sort of one of the more up and coming bands that we've worked with, sure. um, you know, like Goodnight Sunrise and Liz Shirley. Those are so, sort of more of the smaller kind of acts that are developing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then we also have, of course, like you mentioned, like the big kind of label, label guys yeah. um so it's a bit of a mix in there so there was a point to that that i wanted to ask you because um <laughs> i don't are you involved in the sales process at all or the onboarding at all or is that a sarah question for us that's more of a sarah question for sure okay. um yeah i mean i do uh bring on clients from time to time and kind of develop those on my own um okay. but mainly it's sort of yeah that's basically kind of mostly sarah okay well i'll ask yeah. the question and if it's not your expertise just tell me mm -hmm. that's totally fine of course um so you mentioned that it can be a bit of a, a longer process to get into print and that type of stuff and to score the big thing. What do you say to clients if they ask you, uh, can I get into X big mag when they're a brand new band or smaller band? Of course. So this is one of the things I actually, you know, I'm really happy to have learned kind of from Sarah. Um, she's a, she's amazing, but she's very like forefront. She's no, no BS. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, what kind of coverage you're going to get and sort of what, you know, what you can expect from us. And I think that that's kind of the main thing is uh, managing those expectations from the beginning. Um, so basically, we tell them flat out, you know, like you guys, you know, this is where you're starting, right? Um, you know, we do kind of a big search of, you know, past coverage for the band, or, you know, notable points or, you know, kind of all that kind of stuff, um, their overview in Canada, usually specifically um and sort of figure out okay where are we starting and where do we want to go so that kind of gives us an idea of sort of what publications we can target from the beginning of the campaign um and from there we're kind of like okay you know a band that might have you know 200 followers on facebook probably isn't going to get the cover of exclaim uh just as an example Damn it. so that's kind of something where you know we say that up front we let them know we're like listen like this is where we're starting this is kind of where we can expect with, you know, different bands that are your size uh, that we're working with currently. Um, this is kind of the state of things, the industry in general, um, you know, and specifically with media. So we're very upfront about that. And that's something where, you know, I'm very happy to kind of not be working with somebody who kind of, you know, likes to massage all the BS, right? Because at the that. end, that kind of, that kind of hurt, hinders your, your uh, success in the end anyway, right? So. 100%. Now, just for the listeners who aren't familiar with Canadian territory, Exclaim's probably the biggest music newspaper I'd say here. Somehow. Yeah, so I feel like that's probably one of the bigger, like, internationally known publications it is, in Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for anybody that's not familiar with it, it's one of probably the biggest in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. Do you guys mainly, you guys mainly just target Canada though, right? Yeah, so a lot of the campaigns, because we're hired usually by international uh, labels, whether it's from the US or Europe, um, we usually work Canada specific, um, yeah. but then most some of our like up and coming bands like Osiren, for example, um, that's one where we also kind of work on the US and, you know, so those kind of projects, we usually are able to kind of go beyond Canada. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the more, majority we focus Canadian media specifically. Fair enough. Aaliyah, you had a question on that, did you not? Or am I mistaken? 
Well, yeah, but that, I guess the question was, um, can you go into any, any detail about why that is the path that you guys take? For sure, for sure. So I think one of the biggest things um, specifically, you know, in Canada is that we find there's not a lot of big support for genres outside of metal and rock uh, or sorry, outside of country or uh, rock, not metal story. <laughs> I wish there was more support for metal. Um, but basically on that approach, sort of that's sort of where, you know, we want to develop those kinds of genres in Canada and kind of help prop up that industry and that support. Uh, so I feel like I'll, that's kind of where we get a lot of sort of the more international uh, bands and things like that, because they're, we mostly focus on, you know, sort of those kind of genres, like your metal, your punk. Um, so that's kind of where those come in um, and why we specifically focus on Canadian uh, media. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of taking those bands that, you know, necessarily in Canada might not um, be on the forefront and looking for PR, um, whereas the international bands, there's more metal kind of out, out there in the world um, beyond Canada. So that's kind of why why we focus specifically there. Um, yeah, it's just the nature of kind of the genres we're working with. So I have a dumb question and feel free not to uh, uh, answer this question. So wh why why would you feel like you guys are, because I think I personally think you guys are probably the best known for Canadian PR, or at least for metal and rock. Um, why do you why do you think you guys have been able to have that reputation? Of course, so I think it's honestly just passion. I think, you know, Sarah specifically, you know, she could speak more on this, you know, uh, in the future. Um, but she's very involved in the metal community and has been since she was a, since she was a teenager and, you know, going to the show, she loves it. And it's the same with me on the other flip, like on the flip side, the punk, the pop punk, the emo, that's sort of what I grew up in and, and what I love. So I think just having that passion for those genres specifically and really wanting to kind of prop up those genres in Canada and those bands and kind of develop uh, that here, I think is where that kind of comes from. It's more of a sort of, you know, you don't work in the music industry, you know, for money, right? <laughs> you work in the music industry because you're passionate, Truly. right? And that's sort of where that comes from. And I think that's one of the main things that kind of gives us that advantage is that we are really passionate about the music we work with. Um, that being said, I mean, obviously I love other genres as well. It's not, I don't just listen to, you know, punk and emo, but um, that's sort of just where my, where my passion has been since I was 12. So it's, that's kind of what I gravitate towards. So for bands that might be considering seeking out professional PR, what's your best advice on when they should start looking into that and what, what they need to have ready before they start looking into that? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, so one of the things I think definitely when you're starting to plan out a release um, specifically, I think then that's when you should be contacting PR. Uh, because the earlier we have the information, the earlier the timeline, you know, there are specific things kind of in timelines of releasing singles and videos that maybe on the press side that your PR person would say, okay, maybe we should do, you know, release this video here instead, or, you know, this is the timeline we should follow that's best kind of suited for building that relationship with press. Um, so that's why it's really important, especially if you're a developing act. Um, because like I said before, you know, it takes a long time to to kind of build those relationships so you know really your PR person should be on it before the first single is released um, because then that way kind of with that first single comes your first kind of push to press and then the next single the next single so then by the time you know say if you have an EP coming out or an album or a tour you know by the time that that comes up you've got that relationship already and you've got the press already interested so that's sort of from that angle I think definitely the earliest possible timing uh, is to kind of start searching out PR because a lot of the time, you know, you will find sort of, you know, you've had, you know, five out of six singles released before someone's contacting you. And I mean, at I that fucking point, hate that. Yeah, because it's like at that point, it's like, okay, we've got one single left, you know, that's, you know, because the nature of the industry now is everything's done before the release, right? Yep. So it's just like, you know, you have to give PR people that time because ultimately, you know, a couple of weeks <laughs> is, you know, that's a, that's tough. That's a bit of a tough timeline it to work is. with. <laughs> It's almost impossible in actual fact. I think the thing, just just to vent for one second with a fellow PR, um, I think the thing that drives me nuts is when the band will not release a single, but they want it, the uh, all looks out to reviewers three months in advance, and they're like, why isn't there any press? 
like because you haven't given us anything to promote. Um, exactly. Yeah. But uh, I want you to just speak on that for a second. The importance of singles, if you want to go over that super quick. Yeah, absolutely. So singles specifically, I think, are definitely one of the most important things to plan out. Um, because that's how you kind of get press interested, right? And that's kind of how, you know, from the first single or the first video, that's when you're kind of starting to build that story of that release specifically. Um, so those kind of help promote the release in the end and as well, like, uh, really keep kind of the hype going at the same time too. So it's a really good marketing tool to have those singles and those videos. Um, and again, helps build that kind of hype and that relationship with, you know, different media personnel and, and different industry in general, um, you know, and, and your fans too, because they'll see that release from the beginning. They're like, oh, cool. And then the next one comes they're like, oh, cool. There's, you know, they start getting really excited about what's coming. 100%. Aaliyah? So, I mean, you've talked about a few of them just now, but maybe can you get more specific and granular about some of the mo most self-sabotaging things that bands do um, during Ooh. a PR campaign? Let's hear right. some rants like I would. Let's, let's hear it, Natasha. <laughs> so one of the, I think one of the most self-sabotaging things is to not update your PR team on decisions that you've made. That's Ding, something ding, ding. that I find happens a lot, especially with, you know, your, your kind of smaller acts. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, you know, if, if they, they've moved a video or they've decided oh last minute where, you know, this video, we're actually going to release this three months in the future for some reason without telling your PR person or, you know, you have a video that you want to release, but then you just go silent. Um, and then the PR person does not know when that video is coming out. And then all of a sudden, the week before you want to release it, oh, hey, well, this video is coming out next week. I think that that's sort of one of the most self-sabotaging self things because ultimately, you know, because you're bringing that PR, PR person onto your team, they need to be able to, you know, have those timelines in advance and to really get you the best results that they can. And, you know, just not updating them on, on your plans, or if you, you know, contacted uh, a publication and you've gotten a peer, uh, premiere on your own for something and not telling your PR person <laughs> as well. Um, those types of things I think are the most self-sabotaging because ultimately you shoot yourself in the foot doing that. Um, and uh, you don't get the results kind of that you've expected uh, when you do that. <laughs> this has all happened to me within the last 24 hours, just so you know. I feel oh your pain. Oh, and I have no doubts about that. It happens on the daily. <laughs> um, but definitely keep your PR people in the loop. Keep everybody on your team in the loop. That is the most important thing you can do. <laughs> One key thing I also just want to add to that. Uh, I don't think Natasha quite specifically said this, but don't also don't just release without telling us. Like, don't just yes. tell us a day or two before, but don't just release without telling us because that happened to me. Yes. Oh, that's that right. that's happened to us all the time. And then all of a sudden I see them posted on socials and yep. I'm like, wait, you didn't tell me that was coming. There's no yep. PR. There's no, yep. you know, anything like that. So rush to get a press release. Exactly. Or yep. like they don't tell you the pre-orders going up. Yep. You know, that that's that something that's week. really big. Yep. 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 Happens to us all the time. <laughs> Elia, oh, yeah, you should probably break in because we we're probably going to just bitch. For I the was next just going to say it's pretty. It, it's it's I'm I'm shook to the core at how similar that sounds to what Curtis has said in the past, and I guess we'll just keep saying it on our podcast and hope that people listen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> conversely, what are some of the most beneficial behaviors that you've seen in musicians that help aid their campaign to be as ideal as possible? Absolutely. So one of the things definitely is kind of help helping to brainstorm with with your PR about like kind of ideas that you have. I think, you know, I think a lot of bands, sometimes they get a little bit scared and they kind of take whatever somebody says to heart, right? And it's kind of like really being involved in the campaign and really being collaborative, I think are kind of the best ways. And, you know, if, you know, one of the things pretty early on, you can kind of notice, you know, if you need to pivot your campaign. And I think being on board to be able to pivot and kind of make those changes here and there to different things, like, you know, whether it's, you know, deciding to go towards lifestyle type publications instead, or, um, you know, releasing a video at a different time or doing, you know, a live video for something to kind of add, um, you know, to the campaign to kind of give something extra, or maybe it's collaborating on some sort of social media promotion idea. 
um, that you have. I think that's kind of the best way you could be is be really co collaborative with your team. Um, help give Ode help give those ideas because that's ultimately like we love hearing those, you know, because you never know, you know, when something can really work and when we can really run with something. Um, and as well, I think honestly, just being, you know, on it with updating your timelines and, you know, having specific things ready for your PR person, like your bio, your link trees, you know, here's your tour dates. You know, I know tour dates kind of change and they come and go, but, you know, sending those to your PR person and making sure that they have that information um, and your artworks and your single descriptions and your all those kinds of things, uh, your photos <laughs> is a big help. But yeah, those, you know, kind of having those assets ready, having them organized and also being collaborative with your team, because ultimately, you know, things change and sometimes plans don't go the way, you know, you thought they would in the beginning. And, you know, you have to pivot and having, you know, an artist on board who's ready to kind of make those changes and is up for kind of, you know, helping us help them. Um, I think, I think is the best, is the best way to have a successful PR campaign. So I want to jump in here and just ask you, uh, so obviously I, I would imagine, cause it happens to all of us, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we're not the only people that is, this has ever happened to, but, um, you're doing a campaign. It's just not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So what do you do other than freak out? <laughs> so one of the things, uh, we try to do is we'll kind of be like, okay, this isn't working. We're not getting results. We're not hearing back from anybody because sometimes you don't get feedback from media, even though you'd like some, yep. um, we kind of sit and we think, okay, like what other angles can we push? Because sometimes, you know, maybe publications are too, you know, backed up with music reviews and, you know, your standard interviews. And it's kind of like, okay, what else can we do? And sometimes that's, you know, brainstorming some wacky idea and going to a specific publication and being like, hey, this sounds weird, but why don't we cover this kind of lifestyle angle here? Maybe it's something really nerdy. Maybe it's something, you know, maybe someone from, I don't know, a certain video game worked on your album. Like that's sort of where we take that. Or maybe the band toured somewhere weird. Like there was um, a couple of pitches that kind of I sent out uh, earlier this year that's kind of a band toured somewhere. I'm from the East Coast, so I can say this. But, uh, you know, a band toured uh, in New Brunswick and I was kind of like, you know what, why don't we go to, you know, a satire publication and, you know, try to make sort of a funny story about the East Coast and you guys being there with your accents or something. Uh, so sort of coming up with those sort of different ideas and then also taking, we actually at the beginning, beginning of the campaign, we actually give artists a lifestyle questionnaire as well. Nice. Uh, so that kind of helps us that, you know, we've got those answers. We know what they're interested in. So if traditional music interviews aren't working well maybe this publication is doing a piece on collections you know hobbies and collections that artists have you know then we know okay you collect this you can be put in into this kind of big compilation type thing uh, so, that this publication is doing so just to clarify on one thing because I've actually wondered about this because we don't usually go contacting lifestyle ourselves so I, I'm mm -hmm. kind of curious about this so how do you kind of figure like if a band is right for a lifestyle publication? Cause I don't know, like Joe Blow death metal band getting into like a gardening magazine or something. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just okay. asking. I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm sincerely. No, wondering. no, no. You're totally right. You're totally right. Yeah. Honestly, like it has to be something that the artist is really interested in because sure. if you're just like, you know, for example, um, you know, if an artist is say they're into fashion but they might buy something from a vintage store once in a while. You know, that's not really going to help our case when pitching a fashion publication, for yeah. example. Um, you really have to be interested in, in what we're going to go for. You really have to be dedicated to it um, and or show proof that you actually are into this. Like, for example, you know, if a band says, OK, we support homeless, you know, uh, getting homeless people off the street. Um, but there's no sort of they haven't donated. They haven't protested. They haven't uh you know yeah. you can't really go to a publication and then say oh you know this band is for you know getting homeless people off the street right yeah. so that it sort of has to be very specific and you know they really have to like it and there has to be proof there sure. um and also the publications will look at that too and they're like oh i don't see anything about hockey on their page but you're pitching yeah. me about hockey you know what i mean I so do. i mean there are times when you know that we can't do that so it just really depends on the artist so tell me this then and again I, i'm Curious. I'm, I'm not trying to be critical in any way, shape or form, because I'm just trying to trying to understand. So like for lifestyle things. So 
let's say we have because Aaliyah's sitting here. She's in bend. She'll the wing. She's power metal. So um, no, it's not. It's or not, not power. Sorry. Symphonic. Don't call it power metal. It's symphonic, not power metal. Symphonic. I am sorry. I am sorry. We were talking about power metal the other day. That's why it slipped my mind. I am sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, but let's say um, you have a power metal band. Or why do I keep saying that? Epic symphonic band. Sorry, Aaliyah. Um, and well, I mean, you could just have a hypothetical power metal band if that's. I could. I could, but I keep. I, that that's works. What I want, that's what I wanted to do. But I wanted to, wanted to bring a real life example in here. So you got uh, like a, a band like Shield of Wings. So I know you're probably not familiar with. But let's say that Aaliyah is into. Well, she's into Lord of the Rings. So how would you pitch that to a lifestyle publication to get them to want to cover the epic symphonic band? Right. So for something like that, I think it would have to be, you'd have the angle you'd have to take with it is what in the universe right now is happening with Lord of the Rings? Like, for example, is there an anniversary coming up? Oh, she's got um, an idea. I can see it on her face. She's going to want me to do this. <laughs> Go ahead. No, Amazing. like hypothetically, does somebody in the band hate Rings of Power, the new Amazon show about Lord oh. of the Rings? I mean, oh. that could get some controversy going, honestly. I mean, but that's kind of sort of the the point is like, is there something new with Lord of the Rings coming? Is there an anniversary? Um, you know, is there a collection figure coming out of some sort that then you can pair sort of that band's love of Lord of the Rings with you know, the Nerdist column on Lord of the Rings, right? Because if there's something new coming, then that kind of helps the publication might already be thinking of covering it. So yeah. then if you compare that with music, it kind of hits a niche audience, you know, on both ends. Um, so that's where I, kind of how you'd approach that. I know there's a band earlier this year, for example, uh, that are huge fans of Rush. Um, so we were trying to find out if there was like, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think like the publication ended up not being able to cover, but uh, about the rush beer specifically uh, mm. that they were going to cover because they were a beer type publication um so we kind of think okay we can pair pair this their love of rush with this new rush beer that's kind of how we approach that one um but yeah sometimes it has to be the like, kind of right timing too so it's kind of a bit of a tricky tricky kind of dance but so i, th I, I think i have one more last question on this lifestyle angle here um mm. so how do you get the publication interested in covering the band? So like, let's say again, so you got the beer beer publication, let's say, and you want them to cover this gore grind band that's into such and such beer. How do you convince the beer magazine? Like I could see how you can convince the gore grind band. Mm -hmm. So what, how do you, how do you, how would you approach that? Of course. So basically we would have to have sort of like stats specifically like this, on the band's love of beer like do they post about beer all the time do they you know are they enthusiasts are they constantly all over the place are they always trying new beers like what kind of depth do they have with this interest is sort of how we'd approach it so say they are really 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 passionate about okay for example okay a couple years ago we had an artist who was vegan and he was really 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 into cooking vegan food so nice. I had actually gone to uh, Lauren Toyota. I don't know if you know who she is, but she used to be a much music DJ. And she now has a big vegan cooking YouTube channel on YouTube. Oh, her. I do know who she is. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. hot for food. I mean, yeah. Like her recipes. I recommend everybody who's listening. Um, anyways, uh, I had gone to her and I said, listen, like this guy, like he's got vegan stuff all over his pages you know, here's her, his stats for following online. So numbers do matter, especially when you're talking to a big publication. Um, so sometimes it's not always going to work, but sort of pairing the band's numbers, the idea that they have a new release, and they have all of this information about vegan cooking on their channel um, or on their, on their pages, and they really love it, and they can go in depth with it, and they can, you know, they make this recipe really well, and, you know, that's how you kind of get them interested is to show the depth that the artist really loves what you're pitching. Um, because ultimately, again, like back to what I said before, is that if you just say, oh, this artist really likes the game, <laughs> you yes. know, like that's not really going to entice a Twitch Twitch gamer to bring them on, right? You have to be like, okay, this artist really loves this game specifically. And this was their score. And this is, you know, how much they've had and what level they're on. And, you know, that's kind of how, how you'd pair it. And I mean, obviously, as I said before, too, so there's got to be something new there for them to talk about, right? So the artist has to have a new album or there's an anniversary of something or there's something along that line. So kind of you pair kind of all of it together mm -hmm. and it kind of creates a nice little story. Okay, that's cool. So, Leah, we have about 10 minutes left with Natasha. So I know. we're going to make this good. 
I uh, really want to go into social media oh, because I feel like this topic that we're talking about really kind of bleeds into this and how I've heard a lot about bands branding themselves and like posting about their interests online and things like that. How do you think bands can do that best and still have the focus be on their music? Right. So that's actually something that, you know, my idea of social media campaign is, you know, if you think of all the artists you follow specifically, or not even artists, but maybe personalities, you know, whether it's a tattoo personality or somebody who likes hockey or it's an artist, right? Why is it that you follow this band? There's got to be another reason besides the fact that you just like their music, right? There's something about that person specifically that you like, whether it's they're really funny, they like vegan cooking too, like you do. They're a big gamer. You both really love this game, right? There's always another element there. Maybe it's you find them incredibly inspiring, you know, for some reason that, you know, you feel connected to them in that way. So kind of taking that approach because music isn't like a pro like any other product, right? You feel it, it's emotional. So basically how I approach that is sort of an 80-20 mix of content. So that would be your 20% mix is your core stuff. So your albums, your tour dates, your, um, you know, singles, videos, that kind of stuff, your press coverage, your playlisting. And then your 80% is actually kind of showcasing who are you as a band and who are you in the band? So basically, what is your personality in the band? You really want to bring that out, but it has to be authentic to the artist because if it's not, it doesn't work and people will see right through it anyway. So basically, it would be talking to the artist, okay, like what kind of things about you do you think you want to showcase your audience? And that's kind of how we approach that. I take that as like, okay, like let's talk to your audience, make sure they know you want to hear from them. So whether or not that's you making a video saying, hey guys, you know, thank you so much for checking our stuff out. You know, we were really excited to go on tour in Mexico and we can't wait, you know, come along with us, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here's the ticket link, right? It's to really make your audience feel like they are connected to you in that sort of way and that can go along with you on the journey. So that's kind of how we, how we kind of mix it was bring that personality out, connect it with your audience and then also make sure that you know you're adding in your tour dates and all those kinds of things because those are important um but obviously you have to connect with your audience in a different way because music is a very different ball game versus like you know Mr. Clean for example right um so yeah it's kind of pairing that personal with your music because music is personal oh or sorry what would you suggest for a band that hasn't been active on socials for a year or two is just about to release a new album. How would you suggest that they uh, kind of get boogieing? That's that's a question. Um, so basically, yep. <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> yeah, one that I've had to deal with too. I'm just curious how you approach it. Is all absolutely. So that definitely is one that I think before you get to that point, just for anybody listening, is to always try to keep your socials moving. You know. If you don't have anything going on, that's okay. You don't have to post 20 times a day. Um, but try to post at least once a week. And the reason I say that is because A, that's going to keep your algorithm seasoned. And B, industry is looking at your pages. Especially if you're an upcoming band, you're like, oh, I want to be signed. You know what I mean? Like, people are going to be checking that out. Press is going to check that out. How often do you update your social media? So definitely before you get to that point, always at least once a week, whether it's, you know, posting a throwback or posting a silly video of yourself or just strumming along to a, you know, 30 seconds to a cover, like post what you have. Um, and then to actually answer your question, <laughs> um, we would start basically about a couple weeks out from the first single. So I would say at least a month um, to try to start pumping out sort of that, you know, lifestyle type content, that personal type content where, you know, talk to your audience, be like, hey guys, you know, I haven't been on in a while. How are you? That kind of stuff, you know, start, you know, maybe posting old photos that you have, throw it back to some highlights from your last album, some last press coverage. Do you have some playlisting or even if it's some past show photos, whatever, post something and be like, hey guys, you know, haven't seen you in a while, but you know, here's some stuff, you know, and start doing it regularly because Ultimately, you want those algorithms primed for when you actually start announcing. So 
you know, post, start posting a little bit more often, a couple times a week, um, you know, and get that kind of engagement up. And then when you actually go to announce, hey, this is our first single, that algorithm's ready to go. It's kind of starting to kind of pick up, right? Because the more it's like a snowball, um, the, you know, Facebook, if you only have one like on a photo, it's not going to push it out, right? And you got to kind of, the more comments you get, the more it goes out and the more and more. And then if you do that over time, then automatically your content's going to be pushed out to more people when you post it. So that's when you get the algorithm season for that. So then when you go to post your first single, it's ready to go and it's already reaching more people than it would have a month ago, right? Yep, yep. Um, so we, <laughs> we've got about five minutes left. I wanted to quickly ask a question, Leah, if that's okay. Um, one common question we always get, and I think this is a pretty simplistic question, but let's see how you respond to it. Uh, pitching. So how do you think a band should pitch a publication, not necessarily the PR, mm -hmm. but a band if they're not hiring a PR, for example? Right. So first and foremost is to have your bio and your photos, a link to both. Um, and as well, I think an important thing to include would be your story is the main thing. Um, and a little bit about any highlights that you have, whether it's you played a small show somewhere, like include that, include all of the things you've done. Um, I think that that's really important. I mean, obviously, if you have a lot of things, try to pick the highlights. But if you're an up and coming band specifically that isn't hiring PR, is include all the information you can get. Any playlisting you've had, um, any video views, any streaming numbers, include any like bands you've played with, even if it's a small local band, um, your social media, even if it's small, include those links. And then as well, any personal notes about your specific music that you're releasing, a quote about about the single, a quote about the video, um, anything like that, something about the EP specifically, um, maybe, you know, your producer, if you work with a producer, you know, whoever they are, any information that can really showcase, okay, you've got a little bit of activity happening and as well showcase the story of your music, pairing that together is kind of the perfect pitch. Well, what um, if you don't have that though? So let's say I'm a new band, I have, it's my debut EP, I guess, mm -hmm. nothing, I got like 20 followers on social media. What would you say I do? Definitely focus on the main story. Like what can you say about your music specifically that you think you want to highlight? Like, is it that you created these amazing guitar riffs, you know, uh, that you're passionate, really, really passionate about? Like really- yeah showcase that passion that you're really excited about that music. And I think that that's, that's the key thing for PR as well, is that, you know, the more excited you seem, the more willing, I think someone is going to look at it and be like, okay, this sounds really cool. Clearly this person's very, very excited and very passionate about this. Maybe I should, you know, click the link. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing. If you're, if you really stand behind your own music, I think you have a better chance instead of just being like, Hey, here's my music that's it like really be like oh my gosh you know this is my first release but I'm really excited and blah 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 and this is how you know this riff specifically you know it created this way or some little tidbit right yeah. so you can kind of give them a little nugget um I think is the best way to kind of approach it cool do you have like three more minutes or do you need to wrap yeah oh no absolutely go ahead cool um Ali are you good for three minutes too she's not responding so I'm going to assume that's a yes uh <laughs> So Natasha, my last question for you is, so how would you think, how do you think bands should network? Because I think this is a uh, common misconception that people have or wrong information. How should they network? Honestly, yeah. I feel like it's just really getting out wherever you can, whether it's at a show, kind of reaching out to anybody who's there, talk to as many people as you can. Um, and I think, you know, get involved in things like Indie Week and Canadian Music Week and, you know, there's always events happening around the city, go to those shows, meet those bands, those other bands, because ultimately, you know, if you can make friends with other musicians, you know, you can always get on tours and things like that, you know, in the future. And I think that's your best bet um, is to kind of just try to talk to as many people as you can at shows, um, you know, go to those little events, go to those local kind of, you know, things that are happening in the music industry and 
reach out to as many people as you can and kind of give your card, bring some cards if you have them or your Instagram or QR code of some sort and just make sure everybody has it that you kind of talk to. And um, yeah, just keep, keep grinding, keep making those connections. Perfect. Okay. So Leah, I guess that we're done. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Natasha. It's been awesome to hear a new perspective on these topics. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for having me. (laughs) Right on. And everyone listening, I hope you heard something helpful today. And until next time, make like a bull and throw those horns up.